So we've seen before what it means to have a limit equal some value, right? So in particular, we know that the limit as x goes to a of f of x equals l, if and only if for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that for all x, where x minus if the distance between x and a is between zero and delta, then absolute value of f of x minus l or the distance from f of x to l is less than epsilon. So what does it look like if the limit doesn't exist? So that means that I need for every single possible value the limit could equal, it doesn't equal that limit. So I need there to be no L's so that the limit equals L. So for every L, we need that the limit as X goes to A of F of X doesn't equal L. So the limit doesn't exist at some point if it's never equal to L, which means for every L, we get the negation of our limit definition. So for every L, there exists some epsilon greater than zero, such that for all delta greater than zero, there exists some x, such that x minus a is between, an absolute value is between zero and delta, delta, and, right, the negation of a p implies q is p and not q, and f of x minus l is greater than or equal to epsilon. Right, so for every single thing, there's some epsilon. So no matter how close I get, so no matter how small my delta is, I can find some x within delta of a such that f of x is really far away. So let's go ahead and think about that definition in terms of a graph where we know the limit doesn't exist and sort of see what it's saying to get a chance to understand it more. Okay, so again, from the last page, we say that the limit doesn't exist if for every L, there's gonna be some epsilon such that for every delta, I could find an X. So the X is within delta of A and F of X is not within epsilon. So let's call this point down here A and it needs to work for every L. So let's say maybe we thought the limit should be up here. This is our L. So there should be some epsilon, some distance I can move away from that L so that no matter how close to A I am, I can't get all of the function to be within those epsilon bounds. And we can see that's true because I'm gonna have some of the function up here and more of the function down there. If I move my L, I can still pick some epsilon small enough, so there exists some small epsilon, so that if I look at that new epsilon range there, so if I look at this epsilon range here, let's make that pink, I'm still not going to get the function in that range. And no matter where I put my L, I can't get the entire function to be in that epsilon range around that because some of the function is up at the top here and other of the function is down below. So that would be a case that for every L, I can always find some epsilon so that it is impossible to get all of the function within epsilon. So I can find some X within A, within delta of A, so that this is gonna be greater. So definitely take some time, think about this definition and see if you can kind of make this whole thing make sense for yourself. Okay, so let's go ahead and see if we can show that this limit does not exist. So I have the limit as x goes to 2 of absolute value of x minus 2 over x minus 2. And remember to show that it doesn't exist, I need to show for every L, we don't have a limit equaling L. So I negate my limit definition. So there exists some epsilon such that for all delta greater than 0, there exists some x. So that x is in within delta of A, but not equal to A, and f of x is more than epsilon away from L. So let's go ahead and think about what this function looks like first so we can get a feel for what we should have our epsilon be. So if I'm thinking about this function absolute value of x minus 2, I know that's just equal to x minus 2 as long as x minus 2 is positive, which is when x is greater than or equal to 2. So if I'm greater than or equal to 2, 
then I get, let's do the whole thing, x minus 2 over x minus 2. So that's just 1. So I have a function 1 when x is greater than or equal to 2. And then absolute value of x minus 2 is negative x minus 2 when x minus 2 is negative, which is when x is less than 2. So if I divide that by x minus 2, I'm going to get negative 1. So I have this function, which is negative 1 before 2 and 1 after 2. So we can sort of see the limit doesn't exist, or maybe we remember from calculus the limit can only exist if the limit from the left equals the limit from the right. So let's see how we can see that idea of the limit equaling the left, limit from the left equaling the limit from the right from just looking at our definition that we have here. So how do I do that? I need to show some statement for every L. So over here in my proof, I'm just gonna start with some L being a real number. And I wanna try to show why the limit can't be that L. So I need to show there exists an epsilon. So I can pick some value for epsilon, which is allowed to depend on L if I wanted to. And then I need to let delta be arbitrary because it says for all delta. So let me think about choosing my L here. I could make my L be up here. And then as long as I'm not gonna, I'm gonna have an epsilon that doesn't include my function down below, I'll be good. My L could be somewhere in the middle. And as long as I have an epsilon that doesn't include both those points, I'll be okay. And my L could be down here. And I wanna make sure I don't include the above point. So I need to pick some epsilon. So no, no matter where I put my L, I can't have both of these points here and here. So the distance between these I know is two. So if my epsilon was exactly one and it was right in the middle, I could hit that. So let's make the epsilon one half. So then I can't hit both of those two function values at the same time. And then, so I picked what my epsilon should be. So now let's pick a arbitrary delta. So we'll let just delta be some real number greater than zero. And now I need to show what x is going to be so that I get this and this. So maybe here, instead of trying to say which x it's going to be, because what x is going to break it is going to depend on l, I could assume that for x close to here and x close to here, I am within a half of L and see if we can get to a contradiction. So let's assume that the, the limit does equal this L and see if we can get to a contradiction. So I want to put this on a scratch work. Assume the limit is L and get a contradiction. Okay, so how can I do that? Well, we need to try to use the fact that we can't be close to both of these function values at the same time, and we know what the function is. So I know the function is equal to one sometimes and is equal to negative one other times. Ooh, I put a one over here. Let's fix that and make that a negative one. Okay, so let's say that We're going to assume for every x, x minus a less than delta and greater than 0 implies f of x minus l is greater than or equal to epsilon. So that's for sake of consideration, and I want to disprove that. So, oops, I want to assume it's less than or equal to here. Strictly less than. So for this particular problem, I'm going to assume for every x, 0 less than x minus 2 less than delta implies f of x, which is this x minus 2 over x minus 2, where the top is an absolute value, minus the l, which I don't know what it is. It's less than epsilon. 
So if I let x equal 2 plus delta over 2, so it's a little bit bigger than 2, then I know that x satisfies that it's between 0 and delta. The distance between it is between 0 and delta, so that works. That's fine. And so we get that when I plug this function in, this number is a little bit bigger than 2. So if I plug it into here, I'm just going to get 1. So 1 minus L is less than whatever that epsilon is. So that's less than a half. We can put it in our specific epsilon that we had before. And if I have another x, we'll just call that guy x hat, we'll have that one be 2 minus this delta over 2. So I'm still in that right range, so the same thing should hold. But now this is a little bit less than 2, so my function should be negative 1. So negative 1 minus l in absolute value should also be less than a half. So what do I have? I have this number L. Let's sort of do this in our scratch work. I know that 1 minus L is between a half and a negative one half. And I also know that negative 1 minus L, which in absolute value is the same as 1 plus L, that's also between a half and negative one half. So let's see what these tell us about L. So working from my first one, I get that negative L is between, I'm going to subtract 1 from everybody, negative 3 halves and negative 1 half. So L, switching the orders, multiplying everything by negative 1, L is between 1 half and 3 halves in that case. But in my other case, if I just subtract 1, I get negative 3 halves is less than or equal to L is less than negative one half. So I both have that L is bigger than one half and less than negative one half, and that's gonna give me my contradiction. So now we can actually go ahead and plug that back in over here. So since one minus L in absolute value is less than one half, we get that one minus L is between a half and negative one half. So L is between, we'll sort of switch, skip, skip some of the algebra steps, one half and three halves. And negative one minus L in absolute value, which is the same as one plus L, is less than a half. So one plus L is between negative a half and a half which meant that L was between negative one half and negative three halves. And that gives us our contradiction. So it was not the case that we did have that limit. Therefore, the limit doesn't exist. We found a specific epsilon where we couldn't get that limit to exist, independent of the value of L. So these limits don't exist definitely are complicated proofs. Again, I encourage you to read back through this. Um, see if you can kind of figure out where all the pieces came from. You can compare it to the proof in the book. They've got a slightly different way of doing it, um, but it's all going to come down to the same sort of thing. So have some time, take some time, look over that. Okay, so then one more question in class that we're going to work on together. We're going to show that the limit as x goes to 0 of sine 1 over x does not exist, but the limit as x goes to 0 of x times 1 over x does. So beforehand, I encourage you to look at the graph of this function just to kind of get a feel for what it looks like, and then we'll talk about that together in class, and the same thing for this one. So go ahead, look at those graphs in advance. You can think through those proofs if you're interested in it, and we'll go through those together in class.